Good day and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. Please allow me to welcome you to this edition of our 2020-21 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and by a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. It's my honor and privilege today to welcome our speaker, Dr. Robert Williams, who is the U University of Tennessee Oak Ridge National Laboratory Governor's Chair in Computational Genomics, again from the University of Tennessee. He completed his bachelor's degree in psychobiology from the University of California, Santa Cruz in 1975 and earned his PhD in uh, physiology from the University of California, Davis in 1983. From 1983 to 1985, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University School of Medicine in the section of neuroanatomy where he was supervised by the famous and noteworthy Pasco Rakish. His professional experience involves uh, a number of different positions, um, mainly at the University of, of uh, Tennessee over the, almost the last 25 to 30 years. Um, he's also um, held positions at the University of California, Davis, um, at uh, Yale University, and um, uh, has had many um, uh, 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 organizational and societal uh, leadership roles. Amongst his many activities and many pursuits, Professor Williams has an intense interest in systems genetics, complex trait, complex trait analysis, and functional genomics as well as the control of gene expression, the genetics of CNS disease and addiction, the role of the environment in disease modeling of neurological syndromes, visual system architecture, function and development. He's also been very concerned with advanced methods in collaborative research and data sharing. Over the last several years, he has uh, led the um, Informatics Center for Mouse Neurogenetics at the University of Tennessee. And this effort hosts the Mouse Brain Laboratory and an expanding collection of high resolution histological images, atlases and databases on brain structure in more than 120 different lines of experimental mice. Uh, working in his laboratory includes um, several useful, or, sorry, work in his laboratory includes several useful genetic and gene mapping databases. Um, I, and uh, as we were talking before we began today, he reminded me that the genenetwork.org uh, database has been in constant operation since 1995. Uh, he's been a key participant in a number of several large NIH funded programs, including the NIH Human Brain Project and more recently the NIH Brain Initiative. He has won numerous awards, including the Lauren D. Carlson Award, uh, Prize in Physiology, uh, the Fellow Award for the Winter Conference in Brain Research, um, as well as many others. His lecture today is entitled Data Structure, Disease Risk, GXE, and Causal Modeling. And as always, if you are um, watching this video via YouTube, uh, we welcome you. Um, and also our specially selected 2020-2021 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are encouraged to submit any questions for Dr. Williams via the chat feature in your Zoom session. I'll synthesize these questions and I will ask them on your behalf in the last 10 minutes or so of Dr. Williams' lecture. And with that, welcome, Rob. We really appreciate your lecture and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Delighted to be here, Jack. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for that uh, very, very kind introduction. Um, this will be, uh, I've been accused of giving lectures that are a little bit like Toad's Wild Ride at uh, Disneyland. And so strap, strap in. <laughs> well, I'll try to get through quite a bit, uh, but leave enough time for you to ask questions and for me to attempt to answer your questions. Um, the premise is right up here. Uh, and I think Jack, already highlighted some of these ideas. Uh, virtually all of the diseases we care about, uh, the ones that are pervasive, uh, that are age-related, uh, are a mix of genetic factors and variants and uh, lots, of, lots of environmental factors. And of course, the nonlinear interaction between those two. Extremely tough problem to solve, uh, particularly when you're dealing with human genomes where each one of us, unless we're fortunate enough to have an identical twin, is an N of one genome. Uh, so the, the kind of um, challenge uh, slash hubris of accurate medicine or precision healthcare, uh, it, it's really going to be difficult, frankly, because uh, with an N of one, it's difficult to establish models. It's difficult to know uh, what's good for you in specific. It may not be uh, 
daunting to figure out what's good in general for a population, but figuring out what it, what it would be truly individualized uh, healthcare, that is going to be uh, very difficult. So the tasks that I've set myself over the last 20 years, uh, even before we you know, had this phrase, uh, precision healthcare, uh, is how to build up systems, data systems that will allow us to uh, approach the problems. And so the first top part of my talk, I'm really gonna be talking about data types in a way that I think is a bit unusual. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that, but the bottom line is we need new types of data. Uh, Stephen Friend used to call this, or maybe still does call this coherent data. What is coherent data? And I'm going to rebadge that as multiplicative uh, data types. And I'll show you how we're able to generate multiplicative data types. And the important thing about having multiplicative data types is that the lifespan of the data is exceedingly long. The quality of the data, oddly enough, actually improves with age. Um, and so you can be sure that if you make, generate the right kind of data using the right data generation pro process, your data will outlive you and presumably become more and more valuable as the context in which that data lives, uh, those data live become um, um, richer, essentially. I'm gonna focus mainly on uh, neuro neurogenetics because that is my, my area of strength but a little bit on aging, which is why this Grim Reaper cartoon um, is also relevant. So let's go to... So the, the first question, uh, a lot of you are, are formal data scientists and um, I'm going to introduce what I think is a new term, smart data. Oh, well, maybe it's not so, so, so new. Uh, there's the, the classic Fred Brooks uh, quote in the upper right write stupid code that uses smart objects, um, smart data, and then the rule at the bottom, uh, rule five of Rob Pike, data dominates. If you've chosen the right data structure and organize things well, the algorithm will almost always be self-evident. Data structures, not algorithms, are central to programming. I think that's an arguable statement, especially in this AI-driven uh, world now, but it, it reveals something that's very important. There's a lot of data generation, a lot of consideration about curation, cleanup, wrangling of data, but less so about the nature, the fundamental nature of data. So what, what do I mean by smart data? Um, and you know, I could read through this, but duh, we need good metadata. Data without great metadata is really not data at all. Of course, the data has to be QC'd for outliers, has to be transformed, has to be wrangled, it has to be stabilized and put into a data structure, preferably one that's free and open source software so that you can get at it, um, unless there are confidentiality issues, uh, HIPAA issues. Um, so we want our data to be fair, but I would argue that fair isn't nearly enough. And um, fair data, while it may not evaporate, it is really generally only additively useful. Um, and I've shown the ice cube metaphor there in the, in the middle left of the slide. Most data sets we generate, alas, particularly those that are generated by NIH R01s, are, are vulnerable to evaporation. And um, there have been uh, several challenges, both for data and for code. Can you go back 10 years in your lab, in your research career, and fish out your 10-year-old data and rerun the same algorithm that you ran 10 years ago. That is an extremely challenging task. And we tried it here um, about a, three months ago just to see how far we could get. We did get 10 years back. One of, one of us, one of my colleagues got 20 years back, um, but it's, it's tough. So most data exist for the purpose of writing your cool paper. Uh, after your cool paper has been written, most of your data is now uh, essentially orphaned. And if it lives on past five or 10 years, then you're doing something right. Um, but it's still additive data. In other words, your data might add to the corpus of data, but it's not multiplicative. So I'm gonna explain what I mean by 
multiplicative uh, data pretty soon. Um, just some examples of what I regard as multiplicative data. Multiplicative data is data where if you add one vector of data or one matrix of data, it integrates with many other vectors and matrix or tensors of data. And now, instead of just adding one correlation or one edge to a network, you're adding one times whatever is already in that system. So in my case, uh, for gene network for the BXD family, we have billions of millions of phenotypes, sorry. Um, and for every additional vector, we now have millions of correlations that we that are actually not just correlations, they're in a causal network, as I will explain. But Framingham Heart Study is a good example of multiplicative data, the genome, genotype to tissue expression database, protein database, Allen Brain Atlas, and gene network. These are a few, there are actually quite a few of these, of course. They tend not to be R01 work, though. They tend to be large program projects that have been shepherded quite carefully by NIH staff, including people like Bill Bourne and, and Jack. Um, even if the data are multiplicative, very few of these data sets come with integrated code and services that can be used long-term. So GEO is a good example of the gene expression omnibus of a massive data, but there's not much you can do with it if you're a mere mortal. If you happen to be a really good uh, data wrangler, then you can do something with it. Uh, but, but it's a major effort because GEO actually doesn't provide sophisticated analysis services. And then here's the final challenge. What really makes data smart is if the data gets better with age. And I, I can't, you know, it's so few data get better with age, it's ridiculous. But data should, in principle, get better with age. So, um, so what does smart multiplicative data look like? So I'm going to give you a real world example of this, but the, the short version is I'm interested in brain weight. And uh, in the next slide, I'll show you, you know, what, what's the motivating question for me. But I'm particularly interested in brain architecture and its variability. Um, mouse brains weigh, for different strains, weigh anywhere from about 380 to 520 milligrams, so half a gram, roughly. But there's a wide range. So you can see there, one of the strains of mice, the one that's sort of a beige brown color, has a brain that's 402 milligrams on average. And the other uh, strain of mouse, black six, has a brain that's about 471 milligrams on average. And the error terms are very small in this case because we've studied literally hundreds of these animals under all different kinds of conditions. And by the way, to, to uh, finesse any question, there is zero sex difference in brain weight in uh, mice. In, and I've looked at several hundred strains. So uh, brain weight differences, uh, despite the smaller body weight of females, uh, it just doesn't happen in mouse. Um, so if I generate a vector of data, in this case, we have data for about 95 different strains of mice, what can I do with that data? So that's a vector of numbers, 95 deep, and now I can compute correlations of that vector with anything else I happen to have measured in the same family of mice. And we happen to have measured millions of traits in the same family of mice. And you can see in the lower right, a correlation matrix of behavioral traits, expression traits with brain weight traits. So in that sense, the, if I add one vector, I add millions of correlations. And I also show you that is not merely correlation. Um, and if you wanted to get to the, this particular data set that I'm showing you right there, there's the uh, web URL. Any of you can click on that web URL or type it in, God forbid, and it'll take you to essentially this histogram and you can play with it and you can calculate the correlations. So that's what I mean by multi <coughs> multiplicative data. <coughs> For the BXD family, these are, Jack mentioned that I, I have an interest in gene expression, uh, both protein expression in brain for which we have precious little data for any species uh, and uh, gene expression where the platform has enabled us to get, generate a lot of data over the last 20 years. But here's, uh, he, these are uh, massive expression data sets for hippocampus, 
from these same animals for which we have brain weight. So we have hippocampal precursor cell expression data, we have exon array data, we have proteomics data, um, and I'll, I'll give you a live tour of some of that at some point. So why I needed uh, smart data. Uh, so when I started, so I, as Jack mentioned, I was a postdoc with Pashko Rakesh and developed some methods for counting cells in uh, Pashko's highly, highly diverse collection of mouse brains. Some were processed in paraffin, some in celloidin, some frozen sections. They were a histological mess of confounds. And I developed a method that now most of you probably know as a dissector method. We called it three-dimensional three, three counting, which allowed us to get accurate stereological uh, data out of this hodgepodge of... Um, and the reason I was interested in this because I really wanted to know how, how, are, how are neurons in particular, but glial cells also, and even endothelial cells, how, how are the numbers of those cells deployed across different CNS systems to generate function and behavior? It's a question you might be able to answer for one structure in five or 10 years, but if you're interested in answering that question across the whole central nervous system, even of a small brain species like a mouse, you're looking at hundreds, if not thousands of discrete cell populations as we now know. And the stereology simply didn't scale. So it was a question that couldn't be answered in the stupid one at a time, um, non-scalable method. So my, my progression um, sort of following the technology. Uh, so Excel was introduced in 1987. Um, and of course I leapt on it because it was a huge boon uh, from doing things in a lab notebook, God forbid. So at least it was one step up from a hard copy lab notebook. It's still unfortunately, maybe fortunately, the lingua franca, uh, lowest common denominator of data sharing uh, with all of its warts and ugliness and stupidity. Um, but it has worked to a great extent and Unfortunately, I still use it. I can't, I can't get away from it. Um, the second step is to move obviously to relational databases, uh, the simple guys, the, the, the Microsoft accesses and file makers, then to the, the My, MySQL, Maria, uh, DB, Postgres. Um, going to open source uh, relational databases is a big leap for most R01 funded labs. It's actually a huge leap because you need a lot of expertise and it's not expertise you hire for a couple of months. You, when you move into this domain, you are hiring somebody for the rest of your career unless you are that person. So we've had one or two DBAs working on uh, the systems I'll tell you since about 1990. Um, myself initially, uh, when I had some level of technical competence, but now uh, real pros. And then if you want to do what I wanted to do, which was live analysis of all of the data that I would gather over my career, um, you, you can't say, okay, I'm going to do it in R script and hope to come back to that R script in 10 years. The R script is going to be too slow. It's going to be clunky. Um, the whole, you know, somebody's going to say, no, don't, don't use R, use Rust because it's way cool and it's got better garbage collection or no garbage collection or use whatever, D. So it's, it's a constantly moving uh, battle. So we, we opted for web service. Um, you know, I think it was a fortuitous decision. We didn't know where the web was gonna go in 1995, but uh, Gene Network started as something called the Portable Dictionary of the Mouse Genome. Um, and it's still, still going strong. Okay. Uh, so those were kind of my, my steps forward. Um, oh, and I think I, uh, yeah. So three key resources to approach this question. So how are neurons generated? How do they survive? How are they maintained uh, throughout lifespan? What are the genetic factors that, and environmental factors that do that? So on the right of this slide, you see your typical uh, motherhood and apple pie data science slide going for all the tiers of analysis from DNA variants at the bottom, SNPs, indels, ver and uh, you know, CNVs, and at the top, environment disease factors. So sort of progressing up the tiers. If you ask 90% of biologists what those little brown and orange arrows represent, 
they will have no idea. They will say, oh, it's some kind of magic integration arrow. And they say, well, how do you actually integrate across all these levels? And I said, well, I don't know, but you just get a mess of data for your mouse, say C57 Black 6 or DBA. And now you're gonna be able to integrate that data if you're lucky. And that's essentially the approach that the Alan Drain Atlas did where they spent close to $300 million studying C57 Black 6 male gene expression at 56 days of age. That's an N of one study that cost about a third of a billion dollars. I want you guys to think about that because um, I, you know, I've been arguing with them for a long time. They did a wonderful thing for the Allen Brain Atlas. So it's a, it is a good expenditure of money, but it's not a great expenditure of money. Why is it not great? Because it's an N of one experiment that somebody just blew $300 million on. Fortunately, it wasn't NIH, it was Paul Allen, but they could have done so much more if they had incorporated genetic diversity. And so kind of in a parallel uh, Skunk Works project, that's what I've been doing. I'm trying to essentially do Allen Brain Atlas times about 10,000 um, using now state-of-the-art methods. And that's what I call systems genetics. So instead of an N of one, I'm gonna look at my knockout or my knock-in, we're going to use integrative, genetically aware, in other words, variation aware, not gene aware, but variation aware approaches that allow us to compute models, uh, ROC uh, curves and get to true prediction. And in order to do that, we need a genetics reference family, a stable, immortal family of experimental subjects. I call them genome types. They're not genotypes, but it's a whole genome type that we can use forever and ever, amen, as Walt Disney would say throughout the known universe. Um, and these mice are a stable resource. They've been cryopreserved. Uh, your grandchildren will be able to come back to them in a hundred years, rederive essentially the same mouse that you studied. Uh, we've generated 150 of these over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, they've been very well sequenced and all of the data is, almost all of the data is in gene network. And so the idea is to get high sample size, to go to gene locus, to gene uh, variant, to mechanisms and to treatment options. And to answer the question I asked initially, what do these arrows represent? Initially, they represent correlations but they represent correlations in a causal modeling environment, which we get courtesy of the central dogma, uh, which is to say that GNA, DNA variants cause phenotype variants, not the other way around. So we have the causal polarity that we need. So this is the result of the second and third decades of work in gene network. I'm going to just take you through a little bit of this. This is the example I already used once, the brain weight in males and females, um, the 94 different, uh, different strains, males and females averaged. And I said, there's no difference between the sexes. So in this case, we don't even have to fit that as a cofactor, although we could. Um, and anybody who wants to explore these data, either as a data scientist interested in some fancy new algorithm, this is the most coherent phenome data, bar none, for any collection of organisms uh, at this point. There's nothing that approaches it in terms of replication, in terms of depth, uh, et cetera. And I will try to prove that. I'm, I'm bragging, obviously, but let me, I, I will try to prove that. Uh, and I just wanna point out that all of this smart data and all these correlations the family has been fully sequenced, fully genotyped. It's like a linkage study. It's like tracking down the gene variant that caused Huntington in the Venezuelan population uh, back in the, in the 80s and 90s. So we can map the causes of variation to the genome. That sometimes goes by the name of a linkage analysis or association analysis. These are very unfortunate terms because this is not mere linkage. It's not mere association. It's a causal assertion, it's a causal model. So on this plot that you're looking at here that's called the Manhattan plot, on the y-axis you have the minus log P of the association, 
So, um, you know, a value of six is pretty, pretty good. That's 0 0.000001 is the likelihood of a, of a false discovery there at a conventional uh, criterion. On the x-axis are all of the chromosomes of a mouse except, except chromosome Y in the mitochondrial genome. And you can see we have two spots, one on chromosome five and one on chromosome 12 that have LOD scores above about 3.8. And those are considered genome-wide significant. So there's a false discovery rate of about, oh, one in, call it one in a thousand or better for that locus on chromosome five. In other words, we know that there is a cause, causal locus on chromosome five that modulates brain weight with that, that caveat that the p-value is good, but obviously it's not perfect. Um, so this is a causal model. And all of this work, actually, we started in as part of the human brain project that Jack mentioned. Um, so that is how we can add causality to any correlation in gene network. Uh, and we have a, a software stack. The entire stack is on um, GitHub. Uh, it's all open source. You could just do a complete fork and have a copy at UVA, and I'll tell you, I would be totally delighted if you did that uh, because we need more smart analysts and coders. We can't do this ourselves. So coming back to that original question, what genes control uh, variation or what gene variants control variation in uh, brain structure? Here's, here's our first conclusion from a, a Nature Communications paper in 2012. Um, on the lower right, you can see us literally hand dissecting chunks of the brain, hippocampus, striatum, olfactory bulb, cerebellum. All of those just were hand dissected. Quite tedious, but quite high throughput. And from that, those data, those became vectors of data. So there was a vector of data for how much is the olfactory bulb weight weigh, how much is the cerebellum weigh, how much, what is the volume of the cortex or the striatum or the basal lateral amygdala? or the lateral geniculate nucleus. And what you see around that sagittal section are so-called QTL maps of the type I just showed you in this slide, but now with continuous functions rather than points for each SNP. Um, so these are just the continuous versions. So this is cortex, hippocampus, whole brain, which I just showed you in the previous slide, body weight as a cofactor, cerebellum, LGN, striatum, BLA, and olfactory bulb. These data, were published eight years ago, they are now much better than they used to be because our genotypes for all these animals are much, much improved. And we've sequenced all of these strains using linked read technology. So the old data got better with age. And I could, you know, if, if this were a, a Jupyter lab notebook, I could give you this paper and say, push this button, update it to the latest and greatest version of these data. And you could then tweak the model. You could say, oh, I don't like the way he modeled X, Y. Uh, we have to have sex as a cofactor or do the interaction term. And all of that would be possible if this data were embedded in the right web resource. It turns out it more or less is. So today, so this is where, where Jack and I were having fun before, the, the, uh, before we got started here. So it still doesn't scale. Cutting up brains uh, literally with a, with a scalpel is not the smartest way to do this. The smartest way to do this is with magnetic resonance imaging. But magnetic resonance imaging has not been high throughput at the resolution required for the work that I'm interested in doing. But fortunately, as part of the Human Brain Project and the, and the uh, burn network after that, I struck up a, a really great collaboration with uh, G. Allen Johnson, at Duke, uh, the director of the Center for In Vivo Microscopy there, who is a physicist and MRI guru who has been, uh, lucky for me, adopted by the neuroscience community. And so he, he is now, this is a paper that just came out a few, about a month ago. Um, each one of these images that you're seeing here, this is a um, horizontal section through the mouse brain in skull. So the skull has been stripped, but this is, uh, in situ, so to speak, olfactory bulb at the top, cerebellum at the bottom. This is, this, this is an overlay of four 
brains from a black six male, C57 black six, the um, mother of our BXD family. This is uh, same thing for, for four females. And I just want you to look at the male female difference. Uh, again, the registration of these brains within an isogenic strain are just phenomenal. Um, and there's subtle quantitative differences that won't leap out at you except over here where we don't have a corpus callosum in uh, the BTBR strain. You can see the connection across the midline is missing. Uh, but what's amazing to me is the similarity between male and female within strain, even to little dorky things having to do with the shape of the olfactory bulbs. Um, it's, 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 just, it's just striking how tight the genetic control is and how little, uh, little there is in the way of sex difference in this particular case. Obviously, for those of you who are sex difference aficionados, I don't understand it. Humans are obsessed by sex and I'm just trying to wrap my head around that and I still, I still really can't. Um, but you can, I, you know, there, there are gonna be some sex differences down here in the pre-optic area, but um, really the amazing thing is how similar uh, male and female mouse brains are. And I think um, the same at a, at a appropriate generalization is also true of humans. Um, the within, the between strain difference, the genetic variation, however, is very sizable. Um, so that's the, the, um, the MRI and the, the connectomes, which you see there. So we're actually following the diffusion metrics of water protons to see uh, which way the tracks run. But we can now combine this with light sheet. Uh, just some more, uh, just another one. But here's, uh, we can combine it with, um, with functional MRI. So this is a black six male uh, mice over here and the, and the D2, the two parents just looking at rest, resting state fMRI from uh, Marcelo Fibo's group at the, the Gainesville Magnetic Resonance uh, National Center and Catherine Kozrowski at uh, Jackson Laboratory. So they've been doing MRI um, of not only the parents, but they have been bold enough to do, start doing the, the resting state connectome, uh, the fMRI connectome for the, for the BXD uh, progeny children. And so there's amazing stuff that can be done. And I uh, just this morning, whoops, coined this ridiculous word polyphenome. So a phenome should in principle be everything but I just wanna emphasize that this is really everything, everything, including the environmental perturbations, uh, the genetic perturbations. So we can do MRI, we can do light sheet, we can do proteomics of brain or any other chunk. We can do developmental studies, epigenomics, behavioral studies, obviously. And you end up with something like this, a polytope or a matrix or a tensor showing everything related to everything else. So in this case, it's just a looking at the variability of brain regions such as cortex with other regions. So you can see that the neocortex doesn't really care much about the hindbrain, but it does care quite a bit about the striatum, which makes a good, good deal of sense and call, it cares about. So you can look at these correlation structures again in a genetic context. So imagine the third dimension of this being the mapping data for every one of those, those uh, cells in that matrix. Um, and I think I wanted to show you, okay, so this is a, a slide I wanted to show you of now adding. So we take the brain in situ and we do the MRI at uh, about 45 micron resolution. Then the brain is removed from the skull. Uh, it of course gets distorted when we do that. We ding the cortex and we, you know, an olfactory bulb or paraflocculus falls off, whatever. It then goes to Boston in Life Canvas. Uh, one of Carl Diesel's uh, ace postdoc, uh, Chung, set up a company called Life Canvas Technology to basically spread the word and spread the practice of shield and clarity. So the, the, these whole brains are then clarified and you can then antibody 
you can you know, use as many as three, four channels to study any cells you want. So in this case, it's tyrosinase, uh, I'm sorry, tyrosine hydroxylase in dopaminergic neurons in the ventral midbrain, and then just a stain for GFP. Um, you can see the resolution is, is an two orders of magnitude better uh, on a linear scale than what we achieve with the MRI. So now you get the cytology, but you've got it in beautifully segmented regions of interest from the MRI, which is unrivaled in terms of distortion-free analysis. And I just want to escape here for a second and show you what some of these brains look like. So this is an EGFP a brain that was imaged by MRI, then sent to Boston for imaging. And you can count every cell here that's expressing the enhanced green fluorescent protein. That's the trigeminal motor nucleus you see over there. You can see the spinal, uh, corticospinal tracts looping down. You can see the projections from the subiculum uh, looping forward. And every cell is countable here and so you, you're doing whole brain, potentially whole brain stereology. Now, this is a pretty picture, pretty movie. Um, I'll tell you, it's very much state of the art to convert something like that to numbers. Um, and that's where we're going now with a lot of help from a lot of, um, a lot of folks. Let's see, I want to get back here to hang on a second while I klutz around. So that just, if you wanna to go to Life Canvas Tech, um, that, that's their hero screen, the, the one I just showed you. They have several hero screens, but that's the first one. Um, so I've, I'm up, I'm at 11.37 now. Um, so kind of a new topic here. Uh, and this has to do with why animal models are coming in with a tremendous, for, for a tremendous amount of intellectual flack. So you may not know it, but NIMH essentially won't fund certain types of animal model work uh, because um, the, the current director of NIH happens to think that mice don't, mouse data doesn't translate well. And I hate to say it, but he's absolutely correct. But he's absolutely correct for the wrong reasons. And that's because he and other leaders at NIH have allowed a sociology of N equals one to proliferate for the last 30 years. So in the interest of standardization, we've been left with one mouse. So I would say that 90%, 95% of all studies you read that use a mouse model use one genome of mouse. It's either C57 black 6 J or it's C57 black 6 NJ or it's BALB CJ, or it's FBB, or it's BTBR if you're interested in autism. This is completely ridiculous because it's an N of one study. I don't care if you studied 50 knockouts, 50 heterozygotes, and 50 wild types. It is an N of one genome that you're studying. And you may consider the results to be necessary and sufficient. You may get your high profile paper in neuron or cell or science, but it is still an N of one study. And as a matter of fact, it's less than an N of one study because every mouse that is studied is essentially a single genome. It's not even got the decency to have um, two genomes within its single body. It's a fully inbred strain of mouse. So it's really an N of 0.5. In the same way that finally, after about 40 years, NIH decided to mandate that we should study males and females, they're still letting us slide by studying one genome type of mouse. It's inexcusable. Um, and it's doubly inexcusable because it accounts almost perfectly for the failure of transportability of data from mouse to human and translations to fail because we don't even have robust results for our mouse. Results you get in C57 black 6 do not translate to BALB CJ. They do not translate to DBA2J. They certainly don't translate to rat. Why should they? 
It's like saying that this in this figure from all of us, that the old white guy in this figure, he's gonna represent all of us. So forget about all that genetic diversity that all of us put in their figure there. No, we're only gonna study uh, 70 kilogram white guys. That's what biomedical research did for about 50 years as everybody painfully knows. Finally, we've gotten beyond that. We've gotten beyond that for uh, human clinical research, but not for the billions of dollars we spend every year on mouse and rat research. So you can, you can kind of get a feel for the aggravation that I have. I just, I just um, I'm horrified by this. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to at least have a bully pulpit here for, an, for you know, a few minutes to point out this, this inexcusable stupidity of, of what we're doing. So we cannot generalize. So, and all of that genetic variation has to go into our models. So how do we add variation to improve the transport and translation to humans? Well, my simple step has been take two inbred strains at least, mix them up, and now you've got a family, a mixed up family. And here's the simple pedigree. You know, this goes back to genetics, not even 101, genetics one. Basic, basically Mendel uh, could have understood this. Uh, we've got two inbred strains, black six and DBA2J. We make the F1 intercross, which is shown there, F1. Then we make an F2 intercross, meiotic ra randomization, exactly what Mendel did in 18, uh, 64. And the only trick is that we now, once we get our F2 progeny, we put them in a cage and inbreed them for 20 generations and we end up with another inbred strain. Actually, we've got 152 of these inbred strains that we've made and it costs about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 to make each one of these strains. And so I'm thankful for funders for letting me go off on this deep, deep dive into making resources. Um, and I mentioned all of them have been sequenced. So that, that's what it looks like. And you can see we have this meiotic randomization. This is what Fisher did starting in the 20s. So the randomization here comes from meiosis, which is more or less random. Uh, it's very close to being a randomizing process that allows us to extract causality. So what about these BXDs? They're obviously adorable. Um, each strain here is immortal. So that's why I said you can come back to these strains in 100 years. They're all cryopreserved. Yes, mutations will happen, but you can roll it back in time by uh, getting your cryopreserved stock. Each strain comes in a male-female version. So this is incredibly powerful in terms of looking at sex differences. If you do a paired t-test with an N of 150 with 10 males and 10 females per strain, you've got a pretty firm answer. And it's not just for one genotype of mouse, it's for 150 genotypes that are segregating for 6 million sequence variants, which is more than many human populations, including almost all of West Eurasia. So um, actually almost everything other than African populations. Um, so we've got these sequenced. We're building pan-genome assemblies for these uh, critters. Um, they're extremely powerful for mapping because the minor allele frequency is quite high, just like you'd expect for a linkage study. Um, the precision with which you can map a causal locus is on the order of uh, half a megabase to four megabases if you're willing to do 100 strains. And there's a kicker here. You can expand this panel from 120, 50 strains to essentially an unlimited number of F1s, effectively more F1s than you can deal with. And I'll show you that. They can, I said nasty things. I'm sorry for those of you who study knockouts and knock-ins, but the, the nice, <laughs> my, my, my mea culpa is you can take your knockout and you can cross it into the, to the BXD family. So we're doing this with the 5X FAD Alzheimer's disease model. Uh, you never have to genotype these animals because we've done it for you. And you shouldn't study more than six cases per strain for reasons that are shown right here. If you have a trait that has a heritability of 0.2, which is pretty low, something like longevity, if you study 10 each, 
your effective heritability is now 0.7, simply because you've gotten rid of the environmental noise or various noise sources by averaging across genome types. Um, these mice are also, you can see, ideal for GXE studies because I can take each pair here and throw one of the mice in one limb of the study and another in the other limb. So let's run a randomized controlled trial or genome by environmental study using the BXDs. Here's a study we did, we're just finishing this with 76 BXD strains, all females, because we didn't want them to fight. Uh, and we wanted to do a longevity study and males unfortunately beat each other up in the cage. Uh, we put half of them on, a, on the normal chow diet and half of them on a ridiculously high fat diet, the blue diet, for those of you who know these things, 60% calories from fat. It's basically like eating butter all day. Uh, longitudinal weighings, and then we looked at lifespan. And you can see that the high fat diet animals uh, do have on average a shorter lifespan. It's about uh, 85 days. Uh, we've got two levels of causality going here. It's, it's just a good randomized clinical control where we basically randomize these animals ac across the two treatment groups. Fine, wonderful, that's how you do it in humans. But we have another level, which is the genetics. We have the central dogma. We can map every one of the traits. We can go from DNA to RNA to protein to trait, and I should say variability of. Here's what the, these data look like, where the red are the chow diet and the blue, I'm sorry, the, yeah, and the blue are the high fat diet. Um, and you can see, oddly enough, even though, again, I, I could give you a general recommendation, hey, you know, it's gonna be good if you exercise every day, go out and walk or run five miles every day, eat right, you're gonna live longer on average, but you are an individual, not a population. So here on the super high fat diet, there are some strains that actually live longer on the high fat diet. Not many, but that one is significant even with all the FDR correction. And then we, as you expect, most strains live longer on the chow diet, but this is one of the parents. So that's the father, this is the mother, this is the F1. Um, so you can see the F1s don't care really whether they're on a high fat or a low fat. It's pretty much, as a matter of fact, they live a little bit longer on the high fat. So the one size fits all, we've all been taught that, that that's not true anymore. That's what we call precision medicine. But how do you actually estimate who, which, which human is going to profit from a high fat diet? Which human is gonna profit from smoking cigarettes? There are individuals with Parkinson's susceptibility loci who should smoke cigarettes because it'll extend their lifespan. Um, here's just a little surprise. Uh, weight and weight gains are not good predictors of longevity. And in the interest of time, I won't go through this, but you can see these, these fits are pretty flat or parallel. So they show that the high fat diet's not really doing much, um, or I'm sorry, the, the high fat diet is doing something, the weight gain is not doing much. And then uh, the Bayesian network analysis. So uh, meiotic recombinant, uh, there's something called uh, Bayesian, I'm sorry, <laughs> Mendelian randomization that's been introduced to epidemiology over the last, uh, I guess it's about 25 years old, but it, I think it's really taken off in the last eight years. Um, so you can get causality even out of epidemiological studies now if you do it in the right way. The more standard way is just to use kind of the Judea Pearl approach um, to do structural Bayesian um, network analysis. This is um, Bayesian network analysis run by Yan Sui um, using the Bayesian network web server, a companion of gene network. And here we're looking at the effects of diet on total cholesterol, HDL, uh, free fatty acids, triglyceride, glucose, and trying to predict weighted 500 days using all the data I just showed you. And you can see, uh, you, well, you will see that there is no comparable graph for longevity. And that's because none of these measures of LDL, HDL, glucose, total cholesterol, none of them were predictors of longevity, which was sort of a heartbreak on, on one, but, but I, I am perversely a guy who likes uh, strong negatives and it's a reasonably strong negative with the way we designed the study. Okay, so we have 
We are now at 10 minutes. I was going to say a hands-on interlude with Gene Network. Um, I'm instead just going to conclude, um, but go to Gene Network and play with it. It's a data loom. Um, I'm gonna skip this. I did mention this, you can expand. So everything I showed you was the inbred strains. I mentioned we have about 150 of these, but there's no reason you can't make any F1 off the diagonal. They're all isogenic. They all have entirely predictable genomes and there are 22,000 of those to get beyond mere mechanism. So I find mechanism a, it's the wrong word. Humans and mice are not clockworks. We are extremely messy and we're not machines. We are extremely messy, I don't know, whatever you wanna call it, processes, dynamic processes. Um, this mechan word mechanism just, I use it in grant applications. I even use it in papers, but every time I read it, I cringe. It's the wrong metaphor. It's completely the wrong metaphor for biological systems, which do not have a necessary and sufficient, usually. There are exceptions. We really want to get to robust causal models with defined predictive accuracy and error. And we're how, so here's the kind of rhetorical question. I answer it myself. How long will it take us to reach the goal of precision healthcare without experimental platforms with the complexity of human cohorts? It's going to, it would take forever. Basically, we would never get there. We need to have cohorts for experimental precision medicine. And right now, the BXDs, the collaborative cross, and a few other replicable populations are it. That's it. There's equivalent for Drosophila called the Drosophila diversity panel, but there's not much, not nearly enough. Um, and what you're looking at there, that matrix of everybody cross to everybody is called the DLL cross. And I, I, that's where I'm gonna be going in the next 10 years. I'm going off the diagonal into the land of prediction. I'm gonna skip this, but it's kind of a fun slide for those of you who are data scientists, some cautions about uh, <laughs> becoming a data scientist. Don't let the biologist tread on you. You guys are in charge. The biologists will always think they're in charge because they know the problem may be better than you do, but the data generation process is critical um, and you should, you should take charge. Um, I can, you know, this is a common lament of statisticians and data scientists. They get treated as super techs. You do not want to be a super tech. You want to take charge of the problem and take charge of the biology, which is easier than learning uh, what you guys know. So I wish I knew matrix algebra, I'll tell you that. Um, just want to come back to this uh, lovely um, 1939, um, piece of poetry by Edna St. Vincent Millay. It's, it's just, it's an amazing uh, stanza of poetry. I can't read it because it, it makes me cry every time I read it. It's just, I don't know how she dreamed this up in 1939, but it should be everybody's, uh, should be everybody's goal. And uh, prospects. So, um, we, we want to align humans and mouse. Uh, we can't do it with just Mike Snyder and C57 Black 6. We need a whole lot more than that. And I think I'll just open it to questions after saying thanks to the people who, and funding that made this possible. Lots and lots of people helped over the last 30 years. This isn't even complete, but I want to just flag uh, my collaborator, Lulu, who's been critical in generating the animal resources and Piotr Prince, who is the lead architect of Gene Network now. Um, it's really um, a lovely stack of code. I couldn't say this three years ago. Um, I couldn't even say it three months ago. We just finally lifted it over to, to Python 3 point whatever. Um, and uh, just a call out for those of you who in data science, this, this book by Judea Pearl should be absolutely required reading, The Book of Why, all $14. It is simple. Uh, some of you might find it insulting. It, he's he's kind of got an assertive dogmatic personality like somebody else I know. Um, I really, really recommend it though because it'll allow you to see how ignorant um, 
an entire field can be for 40 years. So before causal modeling came in, uh, the frequentist approach completely retarded for uh, what we're doing, in my opinion. And then thanks to a lot of funding agencies, in particular, the governor's chair and uh, our Center for Integrative Translational Genomics, which has made it possible for me to do crazy, crazy stuff that I wouldn't have been able to do had I stayed at Yale. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna stop share. And I guess I'll start my, start the video. That's great. Thank you so much, Rob, for that uh, fantastic, fantastic and visionary like set of thoughts about uh, how we deal with data, how we organize it, and how it can actually live beyond its years and <laughs> almost be, like you said, immortal. And uh, I think that's a very important point is that data that we collect today, if we organize it properly and we can figure out ways to make it available, it can actually have a life well beyond uh, the time we collected it and by the people who collected it into, into many other domains. So uh, your talk is exactly spot on with some of the uh, ideas that I'm hoping our, um, our, our um, biomedical uh, data science uh, in, uh, lab participants will be able to share with each other. I, I, we have a couple of questions from um, some of our audience members here. Yep. I um, see. And uh, yeah, uh, mentioning uh, that you know you had discussed the difficulty of managing data and databases for just the average laboratory. And what advice do you have for people who are at the early stages of their careers um, that may not yet have an R1 funding about um, how they can plan, make plans for managing their data? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I, so having lived through it, my my advice would be don't don't. Sh don't shy away from Excel or Access or FileMaker or the equivalent easy database systems. Um, uh, if you've got a large flow of data in your lab, let's say you're doing behavioral studies and you expect to run through you know, uh, 100 plus animals per year, I would recommend setting up a simple relational database system. Um, I suggest doing it in your own lab. Uh, Jack and I were talking about cloud services. I personally don't recommend them. I think they're, I think it's just, uh, I shouldn't say this probably. <laughs> but, but you know, you can buy a 20 terabyte hard drive for 500 bucks and you can buy three of them for 1500 bucks. And yeah, it might, might be just a bunch of disk drives but you, you'll be able to manage it. So I would, Keep local control unless there's a good reason not to. Um, the, the hardest thing about databasing is getting, making sure you're really good about metadata and the header files for your data. So I, I cannot tell you, it takes, it takes me probably 10 tries to get a new postdoc to realize that I don't want to see their Excel file without an index on the far left going from one to whatever, and an index along the top showing me how many columns of data they have. And there have to be at least 10 blank rows above that, above the data where they put all their metadata, who, when, where, what, why. Um, and if you do that with Excel, you, you add all of those who, what, where, when, whys at the header file, your, that data file may be interpretable in 10 years if you stumble across it and can open it. Um, but if it's, just, if it's just an anonymous, it's got some cryptic header data um, and no index, you have no idea the provenance, you're doomed. So, so the, I guess the short answer to Tanya is metadata. So if you, whatever, if, I don't care if you, you do it in hieroglyphics, if the hieroglyphics have good <laughs> metadata, it's going to be fine, um, but but if it becomes a matter of throughput, then go to an easy to use relational database. Don't let somebody convince you you have to do an open source um, code like MariaDB or or Postgres because there you do need a lot of expertise. It's it's free and open, but you need command line competence. So I would suggest if you don't have that competence spend a weekend working through FileMaker Pro or the equivalent, uh, get competence. FileMaker Pro now is a very competent um, system. 
So it used people used to, you know, they put their their nose up and say, oh, it's just it's not a relational database. Um, it may not be fully acid compliant like the big boys like Oracle, but it's definitely good enough. Um, and you can integrate it with all kinds of other services. Um, so, yeah. Well, with that, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Williams, for that really f fantastic talk, talking about data structures, risk for disease, uh, the environmental effects, and, and uh, how, how we can uh, better organize our data and how it can actually have usefulness well beyond its original collection and uh, be useful for folks like the group we're talking to today is the data scientists and how they could uh, they go to gene network and start playing around. I think that's wonderful and exactly the type of thing I'd love to see uh, some of our uh, participants uh, doing uh, as soon as possible. That'd <laughs> be awesome. So uh, with that, thank you so much, Robert. I really appreciate it. Everyone have a good weekend and uh, we won't see you next week because of Thanksgiving, but uh, enjoy your holiday. Thanks much. And I look, any, any comments, welcome. Follow up with the email. It's at the very beginning of the presentation. Thanks again, Robert. All right. Adios.